located? Uh, I'm in Houston, Texas. Oh, all right, good. And, and you're in uh, Los Angeles, right? Oh, no, I'm in New York. Oh, okay, okay. You know, I'm involved like that with the New York Film Festival with uh, the Velvet Underground, and also I did a uh, concert at the Schultz for Drella that, I don't know, did you know about that? It's, Lou Reed and John Cale did an homage three years after Andy Warhol died at BAM. And I shot and directed it for Channel 4, and it was kind of lost. It was like a, a bad laser disc. But because of the Velvet Underground, I told Todd and the producers about it. And even though Todd made the decision that he would only uh, use uh, footage and people that he would talk to that were part of the Velvet Underground between, let's say, 1963 and when they, you know, broke up in 73, 74, he was very interested in, in seeing it because they're paying an homage to Andy and, and the evolution of the Velvet Underground. It's, it's kind of like a rock opera. And I found the negative, the original A and B rolls, after like years for looking for it out of England, I've actually found it in the lab in New York. And, uh, and then I went back to Warner Brothers, who had mastered the original tracks, and they actually found the original uh, mixed tracks that Lou and John had supervised, but wasn't really part of the song. It was made for the album. But I had someone that does sound restoration actually sync it up to the picture so it's absolutely the best picture and the best sound that it ever could be shown at and I showed it at Telluride now I just showed it at the New York Film Festival great so if you're interested we could get you a link to it no I would love to see that I am familiar with uh, songs for Dorella I, I worked at a radio station back in the uh, late 80s early 90s so all of that stuff, you know, the, and, and it's interesting that you're talking about how um, uh, you and Todd uh, went specifically for a certain uh, duration of years, 1963, right. until they broke up, because of course they did the reunion tour in Europe, and right. but and it and it's, I mean, at a certain point there has to be a cutoff point, right? Right. Well, the point where the reu the reunion tour that wasn't. He original material. The, the, the songs for Drummer was the last original material that Lou and, and John did together. And a, in a way, after that, they kind of parted ways with that. You know, so that's what's interesting about the piece, and especially now to look back on it over 30 years and see how rich that documentation is of what they did in this in these songs and it was only the two of them on the stage so i made a decision not to incorporate the audience because lou was very adamant about saying i don't want a camera between me and the audience and how we kind of bonded was i said lou why don't i just shoot the rehearsals and we'll shoot one one night of performance but i won't be anywhere near you know, the front of the stage. So they were in the what they wore for the performance, but it allowed me then to move, have the cameras very intimately moving in rhythm with the performance on Dolly track, and I could be very close to them, and it became the point of view became more about them with each other than with an audience. And that's why I think the concert film now looking at it is is so unique and different because you don't even feel an audience. You just feel the interplay between the two of them. That's great. Uh, yeah, I don't I didn't mean to get off on no, that no, no, tangent. I, I, I want to get off on tangents. Uh, All right. Uh, but I think it's really special now because of the 
there's interest now because of the Velvet Underground, the film, and what it shows, and, you know, the confluence of images, you know, because what, what I, you know, we, we've been doing talks now at the New York Film Festival, and, and what's so interesting is what Todd has been saying is that he's using the images of the time, and the interviews really are complementing what the visual presentation is of how he situates the Velvet Underground in the cultural environment of the times. You know, how influential, you know, all those experimental filmmakers were, like Jonas Mikas was, was like the home for everybody. But, you know, from Stan Brackage to uh, Jack Smith, you know, to uh, the Kutcher brothers, that all allowed, even Shirley Clark that I worked with in later years, that allowed for the the, the, the fermenting of this this cultural energy and in the art world with Andy Warhol and the pop movement, you know, that was moving away from the abstract expressionists and finding their, you know, talking about materialism, about the media, about, uh, you know, high and low art, you know, that created the whole sensibility of what the Velvet Underground was, you know, and success and, and, uh, and personalities, how, you know, Andy was always uncovering, you know, he was always like, taking away the veneer of celebrities and showing, and actually the interviews, you know, I, I had a small part in really in this film. It's really a tour de force because of the editing and the construction of it. But the thing that Todd and I did come to terms with in, in at least the interviews was that we referenced the, um, screen test that Andy did, you know, where he set up his Bolex and with one light source in black and white. And then the other reference for me with Todd was the silk screens, the photographic silk screens that Andy did of celebrities and Paula Jackie Onassis, you know, that he did, you know, these flat color palettes of different colors laid over each other in this kind of graphic image of these, you know, like Debbie Harry and, you know, the people that were... Marilyn, in, I mean, the... And Marilyn Monroe and, you know, the people that were were interesting for him, you know, and that's... Well, and, and to me, there's a little bit of the documentary uh, kind of pops up at the beginning of I'm Not There. When, when you're... Uh, if I'm not... If I'm not there, the Bob Dylan film. Yes, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Todd said something else interesting, or someone brought this up, where in the narrative form, in Todd's uh, films of, let's say, I'm not there, and and uh, and uh, the, the you know gold mine, and the Velvet gold mine, that he finds an authenticity in the images to reinforce the narrative. Where for him working in the documentary form, he actually creates an abstraction. He 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 found the way of um, compiling images to create what 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 generally documentaries are always trying to deal with pieces of reality, but he's made a collage of images that are more abstract to get situate the viewer in the times, you know, without someone telling you this is how we felt, or you feel it through the imagery. Well, yeah, am I being clear no, what I'm saying? I, I, I noticed notice a lot of, um, in, in, in other words, in, in fictional form in the documentary world where he's using the um, documentary form. I mean, 
that's what I love about documentaries, you know, and I've never left them. I started with the Maisel Brothers, and I, I, I'm involved with ITFA, you know, the International Documentary Film Festival of Amsterdam that's so wonderful, is um, that documentaries are so open-ended that they, in some ways, can go places that narrative films have these restrictions about what you can do with it. And, yeah. But documentaries are more open, can be more open-ended in how they tell their story. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, listen, I love no, documentaries. I, I mean, not, not to get off the point, but I actually just saw this documentary uh, called The Returning, which is about Monument Valley, told entirely through films that are shot in Monument Valley, and not just yeah, well, films of John Ford, but, uh, you know... Exactly. I, uh, documentaries have this ability to make you want to watch them again. I mean, I'll see some great feature films, but I may never, no matter how, how much they affected me, I may never want to actually see them again, whereas a documentary, I'd like to sit down and, and watch it multiple times. The Velvet Underground, uh, for instance. I, you, you know, it's just like I need to listen to it like you'd listen to a record, and right. the third time you see it, all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, that's my favorite song. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, it has some... It, it, what, what I think, if it works, Todd's film, it's an immersive experience. It puts you in the time, but it puts you in the uh, gestalt of, of the feeling of how it felt then, you know, without someone telling you how they felt. Why not put them in the experience? I mean... Look, all films for me, you know, as a cinematographer, is about visual metaphor. And that's what I think Todd does so well, is he creates the visual metaphor for the audience to enter worlds that he's created. So when you were shooting the interview segments, um, were you shooting in 60 millimeter on 35, on well, digital? Well, I, I, we shot on Super 8. And we did shoot digitally with it. But knowing the, that the format, that it was going to be a multiple, like Chelsea Girls, that we would be done multiple um, framing, you know, multiple images. And um, we made a decision that I wouldn't zoom at all, that I would find frames, uh, again, mimicking more like the... Um, fixed lens of the screen test. So, but I did everything to give it a, a filmic feel because it would have been expensive to shoot. We could shoot for hours digitally. So I used older lens. I used lenses from that time period. And I, I worked with um, grain in post with it, and then we also shot Super 8. That was my idea of, I'll bring my Super 8 camera along, because back then everybody played Super 8, and we shot part of the interviews in Super 8. Non-sync sound, but we, you know, we yeah. keep doing that. Well, did you, um, how involved were you with the um, archival process of the movie? Uh, you know, well, everything from clips from I've Got a Secret, to the that was really Todd and the editors, but of course they showed me different cuts and got my, you know, Todd always, um, you know, uh, welcomes me in in that process to to to. But he, this was an ongoing process from like he says, you know, it was during the pandemic and he had this gave him immense amount of time to play with Alfonso in California. Adam, the ed other editor, was working in New York and kind of setting up a structure for it because we were finishing Dark Waters. Right. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Danny Fields actually has a documentary that he did that came out, I don't know, five or six years ago called Danny oh. Says. Oh. which doesn't cover a lot of the same information, but, oh. it, I mean, he, you know, the people you found are a, a 
font of information of that era. Right, right. I mean, there were certain people we wanted to shoot that weren't able, you know, like it would have been a natural to shoot with Paul Morrissey, but he's not, I don't know if you have to say that, but I don't think he's of good health that he couldn't do it. Um, what, you yourself, were, were you part of the 60s? Well, I'm old enough, but yeah, I have to say, I, I knew Andy, you know, in a casual way. I had been to the, um, factory. I live on 19th Street, so it, it was on 17th Street, Union Square, not far away. Max's Kansas City is like two blocks away from me where it was. I had been to Max's Kansas City. Um, I knew Nico. I, you know, I did know I was around that ilk, but I was just, I was very young. You know, I was just out of college. Um, and Jonas, I knew Jonas. I knew a lot of the experimental filmmakers in New York at that time. Was there a uh, specific role that you used for the amount of split screen? Or is, is that something that Todd and the editors were... Oh, that's something they experimented with. Uh, when was the first time you saw that I've Got a Secret footage? Because for me, I actually had, was never aware of that until about a year ago. There's this uh, TV station that runs old game shows. And, right. I, I, you know, with COVID, I'd be up all night watching TV. And I love watching these old black and white uh, TV right. shows that I barely remember from my youth. And right. I, when I saw that, I didn't even recognize John Cale until they announced his name. Right. And then I did a, uh, what? No, I, I, they uncovered all that. I, I did, hadn't seen that until they showed it to me in the early cut. Well, you work with Todd Haynes a lot. You're like the go-to cinematographer for his films. Uh, uh, is, is, is that Far a... From Heaven. Yeah, since Far From Heaven, we, we, that's when we connect. And then we just have kind of a, a very good... We always say to each other, maybe we don't work on the next film. You know, it's like the Dar one said to me, I don't use one actor, why should I use one cameraman? And he, we were going to do a film together where he had three cameramen. But somehow we we always fall back with each other. I mean, the film I wanted to do the most with Todd was I'm Not There, the Bob Dylan film, because he was the most influential, you know, musician for me growing up. So that 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 was the film I really wanted to do with him, and uh, and that came to be, you know, and. Uh, I brought that film up earlier, and I didn't even realize you weren't the, the DP on that. Oh, no, I was. Oh, okay. No, I'm saying that's the film I most wanted to work with, and I did get to work with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Syracuse University, uh, um, again, I had no idea that they had all gone there, all the different members. Uh, I'd actually visited there in the late 70s, and they've got the Sacco and Vanzetti mosaic, which I had seen in art books. On, uh, the, what, was that? what was that? They the, go where? Uh, the Sacco and Vanzetti Mosaic. It's a it's yeah. art where? Mo where? Uh, at Syracuse University. Oh, Sarah. Oh, right. Right. I didn't know that. Oh, wow. No, I was surprised because I'd be like, I'd seen this before, you know? Right, 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 right. Uh, had had you run into any of the people that you were uh, interviewing uh, previously in the course of your work, or was, was this? Well, I, 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 well, Amy Tobin, I've known over the years and run into her, you know, at screenings and we're friendly with each other. Um, I can't say, and well, I hadn't seen John for a, a number of years. Um, no, I would say that those two probably were uh, a, a lot of interesting footage pops up in the film. Um, there's the footage of Doug Yule playing live with them, and I believe that was taken at a university in Dallas. 
Right. Because I don't. Right. I think that only was recently discovered or rediscovered, uh, uh, so to speak. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where that was found. 